today, I'd like to challenge you to change your understanding of plastics in the environment and of how you can contribute to a solution to the problem. Now, when I said plastics in the environment, I'd like to bet that a very large number of you immediately thought about the great plastic garbage patch. NOAA, the National uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, provides us with a map of three areas of marine debris buildup in the Pacific Ocean. The eastern patch, which is between California and Hawaii, the western patch, which is near Japan, and an area in the middle. Now, we don't need to look very far to see plastic everywhere, but I think that we often think of plastic pollution as somewhere else. In fact, perhaps you've even heard dramatic statistics asserting that the majority of the plastic pollution in the world's oceans today comes from 10 rivers in the world, none of which happen to be in North America. I think that all of this tends to cause us to push the problem to be something and somewhere else. But today I'd like to start off by talking about plastic pollution right here. Every morning I walk my dog. And yesterday morning I picked up, well I picked up after the dog, but I also picked up every single piece of plastic on my mile and a half walk with my dog. And I brought it home and I put it in the backyard and took a picture of it. What do we have here? A plastic, plastic takeout container lid, a bag, various food wrappers, a child's toy, and part of a windshield uh, ice scraper. Now these are all things that we interact with every day, if not on a weekly basis. But when they're on the ground in my neighborhood, they become plastic that has escaped the solid waste management pipeline. And they sit in the environment. They should be in the landfill or they should be in recycling. So what did I do? I introduced them back into the solid waste management pipeline. I put them in my trash can. Okay. But what happens to plastic that isn't lucky enough to be encountered by me on my dog walk? It sits in the environment where it's exposed to sunlight, air, and mechanical forces. We walk on it, we drive over it with a car. It can get blown around, it can start to break down. And ultimately, it, through our watersheds, enters our rivers and our oceans. Now, when I see that plastic, I don't think about plastic in the environment. I think about microplastic. So what is microplastic? The problem starts off as macroplastic, exactly what you can see. And when it gets beat up in the environment, it starts breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. Perhaps you've seen these colored pieces on the beach and the sand, but you don't need to go to the beach to see them. You can see them on the sidewalk or in the gutter outside, perhaps even in your yard. That plastic continues to break down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And ultimately, it becomes microplastic. Now, plastic can break down into microplastic when it is in the ocean. If a bottle goes out into the ocean, it gets degraded by the environment. But it can also break down on land, becoming microplastic dust. And that dust then blows around or gets washed into our storm drains and ultimately ends up in the rivers and the water and gets into the oceans. Now, there is no standard definition for what constitutes microplastic. But in our work, we focus on the range from one micron to one millimeter. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of plankton in this size range. And therefore, microplastic in this size range is very food web relevant. Now, inevitably, when I start to talk about microplastic and plastic in the environment, someone always says, can't you just clean it up? Why aren't you working on cleaning it up? So I'd like to say a few words about cleanup. The Ocean Cleanup Project proposes to take a boat, attach a large boom to it, and sail out to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and round up all of the garbage in the Pacific. Now, in 2014, NOAA estimated that it would take 67 ships one year to clean up less than one-tenth of one percent of the North Pacific Ocean. Another solution has been proposed which is a solar-powered ocean cleaning vacuum, okay? using renewable energy to suck plastic out of the oceans. At the other end of the size spectrum 
In 2016, Japanese researchers discovered a bacteria that breaks down PET, which is plastic labeled number one. That's what's ubiquitous in the water bottles that we use so much of. It breaks down that plastic number one into two components, ethylene glycol, which we know as de-icing fluid, and a chemical that's used in manufacturing plastic. So I'm going to suggest that perhaps replacing all of the plastic in the ocean with de-icing fluid and an industrial chemical is probably not a good idea. <laughs> now, while well-intentioned, approaches that attempt to clean up the plastic after it has already entered the ocean are not solutions that are going to be scalable, sustainable, or practical. And trying to clean up the microplastic in the ocean also falls in the category of not feasible. Okay. So now let's get back to reality. Microplastics, all right, they come from plastic that has either escaped the solid waste chain or has never entered it in the first place, and they eventually enter the watershed and the ocean. How much is there? Okay. Another question is what is baseline? Now you might say, you just told me we can't clean it up, so why do we care how much there is? Well, Without knowing how much there is now, we have no way to understand whether any mitigation strategies that we employ are making a difference. The short answer to this is, we don't know. Let's look at what we do know. This map represents microplastic density taken from surface trawls, and I'll explain what those are, over a 42-year period from 1971 to 2013. Red colors represent higher densities of microplastics. Blue colors represent lower densities. And you can see that there's a tremendous amount of the ocean that has not been sampled. We can see individual dots. We can see vessel tracks where vessels have sampled the plastic. So let's get a better idea of what does it take to get a single dot on this map. This is my lead sensor design engineer, Dr. Lou Kratchman starting off the chain of current state-of-the-art in microplastic sampling. Lou is in Plymouth Harbor in the summer of 2018, and he's dragging a filter behind a boat. That filter is dragged for an amount of time that corresponds to a specific volume of water going through the filter, and the filter is then removed and taken back to a lab. Now, these filters can be various sizes. You see a different filter on a different boat in the upper left-hand corner. But when that filter is taken back to the lab, it's treated with chemicals, and then the resulting mix is analyzed using expensive and sophisticated lab equipment by highly trained professionals. All of this takes quite a bit of time. And at the end, what we have from that one surface trawl is microplastic data at one point in space, might be a two mile long point in space in the ocean for when you drag the filter, and one point in time. So, this poses a big challenge with microplastics because what we have when data is so difficult to get is a lack of dynamic information about how microplastics behave over time. We don't know how they move with currents, we don't know how they change with weather, and perhaps most importantly, we don't know how human behavior can impact what the measurement, uh, the density of microplastics is. So this is a big challenge. We can't see them, we can't measure them, and you can't manage what you can't measure. So let's think about what might be measurement features that can direct informed action around plastic pollution. Measurements should be immediately available. We would call that real time. Measurements should be widespread. We would call this distributed. And they should be openly accessible for everybody to see so we can all understand where the pollution is and how mitigation is working. Well, there's a model for this kind of environmental data. It's called the World Air Quality Index. Every 15 minutes, sensors all over the world upload their most recent measurements of particulate matter in the air. And you can go online, and anybody can go online, and get an understanding of exactly not just what is the, uh, the air quality 
in the Northeast. This happens to be a snapshot from yesterday afternoon. But what is the air quality anywhere in the world where there's a sensor? It's, a it's effectively crowdsourcing environmental data. Our vision is to enable the same thing for microplastics. Anywhere there's a sensor, not just in the open, but in rivers, in lakes, in waterways, at stormwater outfalls, any place where we're interested in microplastic load, we should be able to put a sensor and get real-time information and make that openly available to everybody. Well, we've taken a first step toward this vision. In the summer of 2018, we deployed, along with our EPA partners and collaborators, the world's first shipboard microplastic sensor. And we deployed this at Turn Island in the French Frigate Shoals. I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of this deployment area. Turn Island is in the Papahana Makua Kea Marine National Monument. What you see on the map is Hawaii in the lower right in green, and up in the upper left is Midway Atoll. To give you a sense of scale, it's about 1,300 miles from Honolulu to Midway. That's half the distance from Boston to San Francisco. It'll put you in Iowa. 570 miles northwest of Honolulu is Turn Island. Now these islands are uninhabited, in spite of the fact that this sign says population four. But they're very important because they are home to a very large number of marine species that don't exist anywhere else in the world. A sampling of the species that happen to be threatened or endangered in the Marine National Monument include the Hawaiian monk seal, the Hawaiian sea turtle, who we certainly hear a lot of with regard to straws in the water, and the lace and duck. Now, in spite of the fact that these islands are effectively in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and are uninhabited, they are a hotspot for plastic pollution. They are at the southern end of the North Pacific gyre, and they accumulate a tremendous amount of marine plastic, which includes a tremendous amount of post-consumer waste. So we were able to get our sensor out in the field, we got it tested, and we brought back to the lab valuable experience and information that we directed and are currently directing toward identifying appropriate sensing modalities toward creating autonomous, real-time microplastic sensing units. A year later, last month, we convened again with our EPA collaborators and we went out to sample for microplastics and to test new sensing modalities in Gloucester and in Boston harbors. In Gloucester, we sampled outside of the harbor. And in Boston, we stopped in three locations, off the airport, off the aquarium, and at the mouth of the Chelsea River. Now, Lou spent nearly the entire cruise below deck operating the equipment to assess whether ultrasound is a reasonable sensing modality for identifying microplastic in water. We took a commercial off-the-shelf ultrasound unit and we built a custom rig to facilitate analyzing the material that was coming off of those filters. So what did we find? This is a screenshot of that ultrasound in Boston Harbor. The blue material represents biological material and the red flecks are very likely microplastics. This is not in Hawaii, this is not in the Pacific, this is right here at home in Boston Harbor. So what is the right strategy for mitigating plastic pollution and microplastic? Bag bans, straw bans, should we ban fleece? Every time synthetic material is laundered, microplastic in the form of microfibers, which are much smaller than any laundry filtra filtration device, get washed out in the effluent. San Francisco has banned polystyrene. Earlier this month, Los Angeles Times ran an editorial questioning whether it was time for a California plastic tax. And what about infrastructure projects? Large booms that are constructed at the ends of rivers to try and prevent large pieces of plastic from sailing out into the ocean. All of these mitigation strategies require time, money, resources, energy, and political capital. So it is extremely important that if we can measure what the plastic is, 
where it is coming from, that then we can direct and select the mitigation strategy that's going to have the greatest impact. And furthermore, if we then continuously measure during the mitigation and we don't see a change, those resources can be redirected to something that is effective. So measurements should drive resource allocation for mitigation. The planet does not have enough time and humanity does not have enough resources into putting effort into mitigation strategies that do not have impact on the root cause of the problem. But we don't need to wait for new technology in order to start making a difference. So I'd like to send you away today with a challenge to mitigate microplastics entering our environment. Number one, pick up plastic waste that has escaped the solid waste management pipeline. Somebody will see you picking it up and they will start doing it as well. Refuse unnecessary plastic, whether it's the bag, the straw, or the coffee cup. Look at the label when you purchase products. Understand what are the materials, what is the impact of caring for that material going to be, and what's going to happen when you're finished with the product. Is it going to last on this earth longer than you are? Lastly, act with your wallet. Whenever possible, try to make a buying choice in favor of reduced use of plastic. Now, I do believe that technology can play a very strong and important role in managing and mitigating plastic pollution. But at the end of the day, the most important and impactful work will be done by us, you and me as humans. Thank you.